Welcome to the Zach Religious Cast podcast YouTube video interview program that features me talking to some of the best and brightest in the atheist slash secular slash awesome community. This is episode 250. I know I wanted to do the 250 like uh, some kind of special thing, but you know what? Every episode's special. So I recorded this interview on April 13th, 2021. Thank you to Neil, the 604 Atheist, for being on last week. And by the way, I'll be on his show on April 29th. I can't talk about a deconversion, but I can talk about a near-death experience, and I have a beer called Dodgers of Death to drink during an experience. If you've ever been dehumanized in any way, you can empathize with what trans people are going through right now, even if you might not be able to totally understand. Allison Gill dealt with the blowback from coming out in her 20s, although it led to us being graced with her presence in American Atheists. We talk about her origin story, what it was like to have a virtual conference, and the hopes of having one in person next year in Atlanta. Let's start the conversation. Captain's log, stardate 6051. Had trouble sleeping last night. My hiatal hernia is acting up. The ship is drafting and damp. I complain, but nobody listens. Star Trek 12, so very tired. Welcome to the Zachrilege cast. Allison Gill, how's it going? Going really well. How are you? Doing well. So you're coming to us from uh, the D.C. area, is that correct? Yeah, I live in Silver Spring, Maryland, right outside of D.C. So you're where the action is. That's nice. Yes. So when we initially kind of scheduled this, um, we didn't think that um, there would have been... Um, like immediate, well, there's always immediate stuff going on, but there was a tweet by a certain former uh, atheist uh, luminary that uh, got your attention and led to you doing a, uh, a statement today. So what was it that Richard Dawkins said that made you think, you know what, I need to make a public statement? Sure. Well, you know, I think there's been a few instances of the past of Richard Dawkins saying things that were not um, carefully considered when it came to trans issues. And he um, made statements without really understanding much about trans people or the science behind trans people or their lives. And some of them have been unfortunate. And this was another example of that where he compared um, trans people basically to Rachel Dolezal, which is sort of a famous person famous for committing fraud uh, and sort of putting herself mm -hmm. forward as a, you know, a black person in order to engage in different ways and be involved with different organizations. So the implication, of course, if you compare a group of people to someone who's famous for fraud, that they are fraudulent and their identities are fraudulent. Now, this is wrapped up in an idea that, you know, um, he said, discuss as if those were like a, a question that had never been before brought before mankind. Um, you know, that's not that's not accurate. You know, people have had these discussions. And as typical when this sort of thing is brought forward on the internet, you can see the types of discussions that are had. Uh, if anyone cares, look at the Twitter thread. It, I would say it's not a very productive discussion. It's more about, um, you know, anti-trans BS than actual discussion. And so, you know, we we put together a response that basically urged uh, Dr. Dawkins to please consider these issues more carefully and to research it before stepping forward to make these sorts of comments. <clears throat> and, you know, it's important because when he says things like this, it really does amplify all the anti-trans stuff we're seeing from the other side. You know, there's a lot of religious zealots across the country just pushing terrible anti-trans bills. And we also see a lot of attacks on trans people. There's a lot of hate crimes on, against trans people. And this sort of talk that trans people are fraudulent, their identities aren't real, it just sort of reinforces that narrative and, and these sorts of negative outcomes. Well, how does it feel as, I don't know, this kind of combines like the personal and you know your, your job, but to have the kind of, uh, group you're working with, like the board, American Atheists, that's kind of supportive to make this kind of statement and to kind of amplify the fact that, because Richard Dawkins is a name that people still associate closely with atheists, and he's spoken at atheists, American Atheist events before in the past. But how, what is it like to be able to like kind of work together with the group to kind of 
make a statement and just say this is what um, hopefully most atheists think and what uh, we think as a group in terms of you know these kind of statements and how they can affect people. Absolutely, I'm very appreciative. I mean, American Atheist has been really strong on these issues and knows them very well and willing to step up and support you know populations that are under attack because of religious you know beliefs, including transgender people. Um, and so I you know I, I'm appreciative, and I think that you know we were you know the statement we put out I think was very strong and considered. We weren't trying to attack Dr. Dawkins. I, he I'm a a giant fan of his and the work that he's done. I think it's incredibly important. I actually have a background in molecular biology and biochemistry in part because I admire the important work he's done in biology through the years. Um, but, you know, on this issue, it, it just would have been better to learn more about it or just stay out of it if you don't know much about it. <laughs> yeah, I would think that's an important thing to say. I mean, it's 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 tough because these things are personal. I think when at least as me, you know, cisgender white dude can pretty much pass and, and have a lot of privilege in society to to get to listen and to hear other people's point of view and see how these things affect people. Uh, I would think that that would be a very important thing. That would be something that uh, atheists would hopefully be better at than other people, but that's not always the case, as, as you know. But uh, I'm glad you're able to to make the statement and I would say also that the majority of atheists are very supportive of trans people. Overall, if you look at any of the opinion polls or statistics on this, trans, I'm sorry, atheists tend to be among, if not the most supportive group on trans issues and a host of other issues. I think I read a stat recently that was from Politico that said about 40% of uh, atheists surveyed were very supportive of uh, trans young people being able to play in sports associated with their identity, um, which is more than any other group across society. So, I mean, when we see these sorts of attacks, they're from a very narrow segment of atheist communities, and it's just a very vocal <laughs> segment of atheist communities, because I feel like the vast majority are people that are willing to sort of engage with these issues, think about them, listen to those who are being impressed and marginalized, and, and hear what they have to say. Yeah, I guess um, when you can be entrenched in like the culture wars and social media, you kind of think that the loud voices that you hear are the ones that the majority has, but it's just like these are the people who feel like they can say whatever they want and get it off their chest, and that's totally fine. Twitter but for you, life, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. You can't take it all. I don't know. It'd be tough. Uh, because it is kind of attacking, you know, your your own identity, and that's that's tough. I mean, I don't know I always kind of minimize any attacks on atheism because I don't think it's on tops of people's lists. It's not that high. Well, it depends on where you live. Clearly, you know, as I'm in the South, but uh, when it's people are kind of yeah attacking who you are, it's it's got to be a little rough. But for you, were you um, did you were you raised in any uh, certain religious faith? I didn't know if you're an atheist from birth or if that was something that you picked up later. No, I grew up in New Jersey. My family was uh, fairly mixed in religion. My mother was a, I would say, generic mainline Protestant. She went to different Presbyterian, Methodist, etc. churches based on what suited her. And uh, my father was a lapsed Catholic, so he he never, I, I don't actually know if he ever really identified as an atheist, but he never wanted to go to church and did not engage in anything religiously. He, I don't, he never actually said to me, I'm an atheist or agnostic or anything like that. So, um, you know, I had sort of a mixed upbringing in that regard. And I, from a very young age, d decided I didn't believe in in any of that stuff. I, I don't know exactly how young I was, because I definitely remember going to Sunday school when I was young, but I think when I was a teenager, uh, early teenager, I decided that it was no longer for me and sort of put my foot down. <laughs> so, which is hilarious, but true. <laughs> well, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. I don't know for sure. For some people, they were really in and then got out, but I didn't yeah. think it was a big part of your story. Like, oh, I was a believer and then came out, but I was just interested to to hear that. I did have some negative interactions with religion when I was in New Jersey, though. Um, like one story I have is that um, I went to this magnet school 
uh, which is, you know, a, a public, public school, but it's like a specialized school out on Sandy Hook, which is sort of uh, out pretty far away from where I grew up. It's about an hour and a half in the county from where I grew up. And um, so I didn't have a lot of, all my friends were scattered all over the county and I didn't have a lot of friends like in the actual town where I lived, which made it challenging to, you know, hang out with people and do things when I was in high school. And so I found out I've always been a giant gamer um, and D and D play Dungeons and Dragons player. And so I found out that they were, um, you know, they were forming a gaming club at my home high school, the one I didn't go to that I could then participate in. I was super excited and really wanted to engage that so I could meet some people locally. And um, I was actually protested and the school, they were for, the school was forced not to actually allow the gaming, um, you know, student organization by the Federation of Christian Athletes. They sort of protested and they called it satanic, you know, and this was the days where, Satanic panic, it was in the 90s, so satanic panic. Yeah, was I was wondering, the satanic panic was a very, yeah, 80s, 90s. It seems like it's maybe making a renaissance in a bit, but yeah, Dungeons and Dragons, ooh, that was, I mean, that was, that was rough stuff right there. Yeah, exactly. And anyway, they, they managed to stop it from ever forming. So, like, this religious group has had to be, I don't know, moral busybodies and stop me from <laughs> making friends in my town, which was not great. Where you're able to uh, overcome? Do you still do any of that Dungeons and Dragons stuff? Is it time? Because I feel like there was a time when I was growing up. Is like, oh, you play games as a kid, and then you grow up, and that's over. But then, as I grew up, people just kept playing you know, video games and board games, and now with people being stuck in their homes, they're doing it online. So it seems to be, uh, you know, they're in podcasts about uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Absolutely, they're great. I follow those several of those closely, and I, I play in two games and I run two games. So I would hmm. say it's a major pastime. <laughs> Plus, yeah, the Venn diagram of like kind of people on the nerd scale and being atheist is kind of a circle. There's, there's, yeah, it's, it's just about, just about anyone. Yeah. But yeah, um, I've written some D and D books. They're under a different name. I wrote them back a while ago, but they were um. Hmm. I guess they were in third edition and 3.5th edition. I don't know if, if you want to get that far into it. I don't uh, <laughs> I don't know if you know much about Dungeons and Dragons. Have any of those books in your bookshelf behind you or? No, those are all cool legal terms. Yeah. In the other room over there. <laughs> well, Deborah in the chat room, big legal geek. So um, yeah, can definitely do some, some law discussion on that. Uh, when I was a questions, uh, I know where to go. Um, but w in terms of like growing up, when did you kind of know that you were different and that you were like, you actually had like terms and words to just to discover yourself as being trans? Um, you know, I don't have a specific time when I realized it. I've since as young as I can remember, I knew I was sort of a girl, if that makes sense. I, I don't really, um, I didn't really have words for it until I was like older uh, and like in high school. But I knew very, very young and it was always very distressing. <laughs> so it was, it was really challenging, especially going through like puberty and that sort of thing was really, um, really, really distressing. And so, you know, it was, um, I, don't, I don't really have other words for it. Well, I couldn't see how it could be anything else. Remember, you know? really? Oh, I'm sorry. What'd you say? Well, I mean, the term is that people use gender dysphoria, and it comes off as like a clinical term. But yeah, just to be growing up and be seen as one thing and realize that that's not who I really am has to be, yeah, a stressful thing. It was. It was stressful, and um, I, I had a lot of depression as a child, and because I was afraid to talk about it. Um, it was unclear to my family what I was depressed about or why I was having so much depression, you know? So that was challenging um, because I, you know, I was afraid to talk about it. And, and you know, I didn't really transition until I was in my mid-20s. Um, there was just, when I was young, you know, I may look young, but I'm, you know, in my 40s, when I was young, there was no resources out there about trans issues. So there was just nowhere for me to turn. I feel it's very different these days for trans young people 
they're able to find basically find resources and um, you know know what trans is or ha how to sort of get help that just did not exist uh, at all and the internet was not nearly as developed then as it is now so the first time I really sought help was I was in college and I didn't even know where to turn there now they have like LGBT resource centers and that sort of thing mm -hmm. but when I was in school they didn't have that and so I called up like the psychology department and I asked them hey can I get some help with gender dysphoria and they're like we don't know what that is <laughs> so I'm like oh oh well <laughs> so it, it was really um challenging yeah at that time yeah you hear stories a lot about people who are realize they're atheist and then go, I didn't think anyone else was in my area or I didn't know anybody. And you don't, you can't just like ask every person, you know, to, to get, cause you get a very negative response, but yeah. But do you, I mean, this is more personal than your work with American atheists and we'll definitely get there shortly, but uh, is it for you to be able to like connect to like, trans kids who are struggling because there are all these laws trying to be passed, like limiting their ability to transition or even have access to doctors. And, you know, in the state of Georgia where I live, they're actually having possibly having doctors check people's genitals to play sports, which is kind of gross, no matter what sports it is. It seems like not what they want to do, but how do you, I don't know, like connect with, you know, how you felt when you were that age or how you- Yeah, I used it. to, earlier in my career, I used to work mostly in the LGBTQ movement. And a lot of the work I did was focused on uh, LGBTQ young people. So I used to work, for example, with GLSEN, the Gay Lesbian Street Education Network, which focuses on anti-bullying policies and non-discrimination laws. And so I've done a lot of work with them. I was also the government affairs director at the Trevor Project previously, and they focus on uh, suicide prevention among LGBTQ youth. So I've done a lot of work in this field in different organ, and also I worked at the Human Rights Campaign. So focusing on these issues there as well. So, you know, I've done a lot of work in this field and I think um, it was really disappointing to see under the Trump administration, frankly, so much that I had worked to build sort of just torn down by the new administration in just a few days, like the um, the trans policy that the Obama administration had passed to sort of tell schools how to be accepting of trans young people. Um, that was something I worked quite a lot on and that was uh, just sort of torn away. Things like that were really, um, really unfortunate. So uh, I am glad to see that the work is continuing. However, the uh, just terrible flat out assault we're seeing all across the country on trans children is just it's horrifying. I mean, we're seeing, I think there's more than 75 bills in 47 different states. That's it's, it's that bad mm -hmm. and that widespread. It's just not getting as much media attention either as it deserves. Um, so it's, I think we're seeing politicians who think they can get some political advantage out of beating up on a small powerless minority who are children, just doing it. Um, and it's, it's really despicable. Yeah, is there any way to kind of bridge that empathy gap? Because it's gotta be tough gonna be tough for the parents but then the parents tend to maybe take the side of being on the more conservative but then being empathetic toward the kids no matter what you think about somebody's identity it's like to just say no you can't be that way and there's a real push for like just gender norms in general it's just yeah. ridiculous like a you know a pop star wearing a dress and this is like a straight guy but it's like oh no it's like all the gender norms are being attacked it's like give me a break you know I, I thought we had started to get past that decades ago, right? It's, it's uh, terrible. It's so. regressive pushing on gender norms of all things. It's, it's, um, yeah, um, you know, there's always this type of backlash as we start to make progress on in these important issues and on people's human rights, right? But I'm hopeful, you know, a lot of these things, I am hopeful that the courts will push back on them, um, especially like the, the sports bills. I'm pretty sure those conflict with things like Title IX, the federal federal non-discrimination law. Um, so, you know, I, I think that these are issues that hopefully we'll be able to push back in the courts. Regarding the medical bans, those are just so awful. I feel like, you know, it's really important that we defeat these and don't allow them to move forward. I mean, they're denying 
young people medical care that they need. It's not like it's some sort of fad. <laughs> it's medical, you have to go through a lot to get medical care and to put more barriers in front of people. And there's this misconception that trans medical care for trans young people involves like surgery or something. It does not, you know, it's not about that. It's about therapy and like puberty blocking drugs potentially and things like that, but nothing, nothing that's not reversible. Yeah, and there's this push to just not allow, yeah, and, or to, to say that, like, kids who are like, oh, they're going along fine alive, and all of a sudden they, they see something online, they're like, I'm trans, and it's like, how do you think that happens? Like, I don't know. Like, you don't, I just don't think uh, people get it. I think some people are pushing a narrative, and I think there's just some people who are just like, well, that sounds legitimate. Right, and that might have been what happened with Dawkins, although he sure seems to be repeating himself a lot, so that's never a good thing. But you mentioned um, your kind of college background. How did you go from being like molecular biology and chemistry to like, hey, I want to be a lawyer? Like, what what was that transition? Yeah. Well, I did mock trial when I was in high school, so I had a little bit of some of that experience, and I really enjoyed it. When I was in, um, I always wanted to get a PhD and, um, you know, work in labs. I was very into biology and biochemistry when I was younger. And I did that for four years in college. And I, um, you know, it was okay. I, I learned about it. I realized I'm not quite as much of an introvert as I thought I was, that I actually need to see people and not yeast at some point during the day. And so I realized that it was not probably the best career for me. Uh, and so instead, I went to law school, and originally I had hoped to sort of combine my love of science and my love of law and do patent law. And so I went to, I did study quite a lot of patent law, and I worked in that field for a bit. But um, I ended up focusing more on civil rights issues, particularly after I transitioned. So that's how I got more engaged where I am currently working in the LGBT movement and then in the secular movement. Yeah, what, um, so you always wanted to be kind of in the non-profit side, like, you know, they make the joke about lawyers, like, oh, they're going in for the, you know, the big bucks, but no, really you're like, hey, uh, let's make some social, uh, social progress here. No, I actually well, wanted to do it, finally. Patent law, like, I really wanted to do patent law, that was my goal, I wanted to, I mean, it, it's, it's really a fascinating field to combine science and learn about cutting edge things and figure out how to turn that, how to protect them legally, you know, it's, it's really interesting, I think. Um, but, yeah, so I didn't, uh, I did not want to do that. <laughs> However, that's where I ended up, um, in part because I uh, faced some, unfortunately, some employment consequences when I came out which all too mm. often happens. And I had a lot of trouble getting into the field uh, without any sort of references and a different name. And so I was sort of forced to go into civil rights stuff, but then I found it really suited me a lot better. So, and I really enjoy it. So I, you know, just sort of stayed in it and went along. <laughs> you never can predict these things though, right? That's true, yeah. So how did you end up at uh, American Atheist? Well, I was, um, I guess in 2015, I was doing consulting work. I had formed like a small consulting firm and doing work for nonprofits and uh, foundations. And then when Trump came into office, I just saw him doing horrible things and tearing up regulations and like undermining important civil rights protections. And I felt kind of powerless and like I wasn't really accomplishing a lot. So I started to look for opportunities to go into civil rights and look for appropriate things that would, you know, fit me in my background. I've been a big fan of American Atheist for years and years. Uh, I don't know. I, I remember the whole Bill O'Reilly situation with David Silverman back in the day, and I was a big fan of that. So <laughs> that was, um, I remember seeing that, that live at the time. But I, so I've, I've always known about the organization. And when I saw they had an, uh, an opening, I was like, oh, I'm definitely going to put my name in. And it just sort of worked out. So that's really it. So at a high level, like what do you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, your position VP, uh, I think it's legal and policy. I want to make sure I get the correct term. That's right. Sure. So I run our DC office. Uh, I manage our staff there. Uh, we have a litigator who's full time and we often have law clerks, uh, usually somewhere between zero and three law clerks. And um, 
I manage most of our advocacy work. So that includes our work to make advocacy change at the federal, state, and local level. Uh, and also through administrative agencies like the Department of Education or Department of Justice. And I oversee our litigation work that our litigator focuses on um, and help him sort of decide which cases to take and how to pursue things. So um, that is most of it. So on a day-to-day -day basis, it really does vary based on the time of year. Right now, we have all 50 legislative sessions open in states, plus DC, Puerto Rico. So there's a lot happening in state legislation. And um, a major part of that, uh, since I began at American Atheist, one of the major thing focuses has been shifting to state legislation. Because I feel like we can get more done in the states, both pushing back on negative things that are happening and also working to promote positive laws and policies. So, you know, right now when all the states are active, there's my cat. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, cat appearance. Anna. Oh, tuxedo, nice. Um, and so, <laughs> they're going to say. Um, so now, right now, it's really, really busy with state work, right? And then as those start to close, we'll be able to focus more on other types of advocacy. For example, administrative advocacy um, with the new administration and focus on some of the federal work that needs to be done. But right now, it's mostly state work all the time. Yeah, I guess that's a, that's a big thing. So do you have, uh, I know American Atheist's goal is to have 50 like state directors. And I, I listened to an interview with Arn Rock a couple years ago and you said there are a few states that are missing. So you still, uh, you got people in every state now? Not yet, we're growing it. It's been, I mean, one yeah, of the ways we find people is to travel, to meet people at events in different locations. And for the past year, that's not really been feasible, right? So mm. it's been challenging. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it's still growing. And our, our field director, Sam McGuire, is really in charge of that program. She's fantastic and you know travels a lot to meet different groups and find suitable people that could be either full state directors for the entire state or um, assistant state directors for like a municipality or a particular area. And so we've got a lot more assistant state directors and it's best to have like a team we find in, in the state. So both a state person and a few assistants that they can work together to sort of work with local groups and, um, you know, advance policy goals, all those sorts of things. Yeah, understood. Um, so you, you gave a talk a couple years ago at the American Atheist Conference uh, about Project Blitz. So how did you kind of discover it and how are we fighting this kind of Christian nationalist push in the country? Sure. So um, I can't claim, claim credit for discovering it. It was actually Frederick Clarkson, uh, PRA, Political Research Associates, I think that discovered Project Blitz. And he wrote this great article um, comparing it to ALEC, which is a pretty famous sort of conservative business association that puts forward um, you know, right-wing bills and sort of copy pastes them to state, different from state to state to state. So he called it the ALEC of Christian nationalism. And, um, so he put forward, you know, he helped make aware everyone of this model policy guide that they have, which has over 20 different model bills in it. And also this network that they established in different states around the country, they have uh, what they call state uh, caucuses. So like uh, prayer caucuses in different states. So, you know, this was all originally on the, on the internet. They weren't even sort of hiding it. And based on our work, uh, us and PRA and working in coalition with different groups, we're able to really elevate this in the press and make many more people aware of it. Uh, we actually did a Hill, Hill briefing on this at the Capitol Hill a couple years ago to raise more awareness. And since then, they've actually removed much of the material from their websites and they've been much more secretive because <laughs> it's much more difficult for them to pass these sort of photocopied laws that are directly related to Christian nationalism with the level of observation that we sort of focused on them. So I think that's been successful in many ways. Although frankly, these bills are passing this year. Um, I found probably the most Christian nationalist bill ever, unfortunately, that was just moving forward in Texas. We just submitted a testimony on it. It's being heard tomorrow. Um, it's, it, they already have bills allowing uh, prayer, uh, not prayer, I'm sorry, Bible classes in schools, right, in Texas. Right. It basically, it says that um, um, the Bible classes are allowed to serve as a substitute for social studies. 
Ooh. <laughs> so I can't, yeah. And what a great example of Christian nationalism right there, right? The Bible serving as uh, social study. There you go. So we're getting some, uh, probably a David Barton book or two in there. I'm for sure. I'm sure. It's one of the, I don't know, those names that people don't know. I feel like it was Mike Huckabee mentioned him on Jon Stewart. So he had him on and he became, and people were like, oh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, it seemed like being like openly Christian nationalist was a winning strategy. And now maybe it's not. You think because like Biden won and everybody thinks, well, the Democrats are in charge that that might actually be a bad thing because in a way people think, well, we're good because we have a, a president who's not just openly courting evangelicals when, you know, when you're looking on a state level, it's, it's definitely a lot of red going on. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think it was a little bit the case under president Obama. I think people did tune out a little bit. I think after what we saw on the Hill on January 6th and you know, what we're seeing in the States more so, like these you know, waves of negative bills. It, it seems to me that people are paying a lot more attention, um, which is great, but to this issue. Like they're not just going to let the is issue drop regarding, you know, treason and Christian nationalism and those things. So I think people are paying a lot more attention to it. Um, and, but who knows what will happen in the future? I think it's part of our work is to keep people focused on these bad things that are, ha I mean, you know, to point out when bad things happen and also point out successes because frankly, there's already been some under, under President Biden, which is great. I mean, we're not where we want to be, but he is uh, starting to roll back some of the worst things starting to. Well, I mean, speaking of successes and we can't, you know, be totally negative on this, uh, on this episode, how was uh, the latest American Atheist Conference? You know, the one that because last year was supposed to be in person, then it became virtual, and this year's conference was virtual all the way. What was it like? You know, now that you're, you've had a week to kind of recover. What was it like uh, doing doing the virtual conference like all the way? You know, Easter great. weekend. Yeah, I was. Uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, we have other staff that sort of manage the conference, so I I presented, but I wasn't like setting it up in the background. And it looks, um, it was fantastic. I was not as familiar with the platform that we use, but I think it was really, really great. We had uh, over a thousand people register, um, which is a little bit more than a typical conference. And we had over 800, I think over 850 people um, actually attend uh, at different points during the, the, the weekend. So I think it was very successful. You know, it's always different have a virtual conference versus online but i think a lot of the features that allow people to get together and like breakout rooms and have like just we actually had discussion around star trek for example uh in some of, of the rooms so that was fun i just noticed that because i saw a previous person that you're interviewed with steve schreier and i <laughs> was just reminding me of that anyway um so regardless i it was a lot of fun breakout events and a lot of good social stuff as well as the important activism and i really like the programming that we did as well i think it um, highlighted a lot of important issues that, uh, like, for example, there was a panel of folks who left very controlling religions, um, like uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, and uh, a couple others. So it was um, evangelicalism, Mormonism. So there were, it was really good to hear those stories. And I think that's an important perspective that, you know, people don't often hear. And are you planning on doing in-person conference next year? Yeah. Well, where's that conference going to be? It's going to be, and you probably never heard, my... it. probably never heard of it. It's uh, called Atlanta. Atlanta. Huh. Atlanta. Yeah, Atlanta, Georgia. And it's always Easter weekend, so it's going to be Easter weekend. And then the year after that, we're going to be, hopefully, for, in Phoenix. We've been delaying that one for three years. So Phoenix in uh, 2023. Yeah, people have been paying attention. Like one of the sneakily conservative states, Arizona. So, yeah, yeah Phoenix is a is a good uh, is a good location uh, for sure. Someone pointed this out to me. I really I like the perspective recently. It's that where we're seeing a lot of the worst, the most controversial, you know, conflict between different sides is in states that are closely balanced, where there are, for example 
you know, it's not like politically skewed one way or another, but states like Georgia and like Arizona, where things are, you know, politically on a knife's edge, we're seeing a lot more conflict and bad things come out of it. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it, I think that's certainly the case in at least some, some instances. Well, what uh, made you decide to kind of get to know the community a little better and do a, like a secular survey that I think it was last year? Yeah, we did the survey in 2019. And the reason, um, so I mentioned I had worked a lot in the LGBTQ movement. Part of my work that I've done for years is focused on around data collection. And that's because in many surveys for, you know, forever, for decades, uh, there had never been really full inclusion of LGBTQ people in federal surveys. Federal surveys are incredibly important because that's how we know stuff about communities. Like if you don't exist in like the education surveys and the health surveys, then you don't exist to those policymakers making decisions about education and health. Great. So getting that, that work has been very successful in LGBTQ people. But right now there's almost none of those things that cover atheists, right? Or religion in general. There's actually a law that was passed in 1972 that prohibits the census from asking questions about religion. Um, I think it had to do with some, you know, some beliefs from some sex about uh, the mark of the beast and tracking and all that stuff. But regardless, it doesn't, uh, it, there's very few federal surveys. Well, I've been vaccinated, so I have the mark. Oh, it's too late for you. <laughs> exactly. I had G all the way. But regardless, there's not a lot of data collection. So if the federal government isn't doing it, that means we have to do it ourselves as a community in order for us to have accurate data about our secular communities. We have to be able to talk about what, you know, not just anecdotes, but real reality, what people face in their lives, what challenges they have, like what issues are important to them, um, where people live, what how they identify themselves. These are all really important questions and we just completely lack data. So. Now we had over 34, well, almost 34,000 people participate in the U.S. Secular Survey, and we produced a report um, last May called Reality Check, and it's all available at uh, secularsurvey.org, so secularsurvey.org, and we're in the process of releasing like subpopulation briefs. Like we released one earlier this year with um, the Secular Student Alliance, focusing on young people ages 18 to 24. So a subset of the full data. And we're working on several others at the moment as well that will be coming out this year. So do you have any like sneak previews and some things that you've learned from that data that uh, I don't know if it was surprising or just interesting facts? Yeah, it always struck me, um, you know, having grown up in New Jersey and living in DC area, how people in different areas of the country experience being non-religious, right? It's very, very different from where I grew up, where I mentioned like one minor thing that affected me because of, you know, religious issues. Then growing up in like Alabama, where it's very different <laughs> and our data really, really backs that up. Like we're seeing threefold differences in levels of uh, discrimination in, in education, for example, in very religious communities versus not very religious communities. So the level of religious oppression for non-religious people is just so much higher. It's really significant. And I feel like those of us who live in, you know, more diverse communities that are less religious sort of take that for granted. We think, oh, this isn't really a problem. There's not really discrimination against non-religious people in this country, but that's really false. It is absolutely the case in schools, in work, in, you know, just going to the bank, all sorts of different places, people face discrimination for their non-religious beliefs. And, um, you know, we have to talk about that and we have to figure out what to do about it. So that's one of the major outcomes of the survey, I think is real most important. Well, I hope this community like is big on numbers. So to be able to have some results that people can kind of go, oh, the people actually will listen to it. That's a, that's a good cause. Yeah. And there are a lot of, uh, kind of petitions that you do as part of American Atheist and, and one was about a proposal to remove restriction on SBA money to churches like the Paycheck Protection Program. What happened as a result of that? Like, yeah. Was it, was it the action that the Sadly. Biden administration has done? Sadly, that's one that we lost. Um, so 
basically under the CARES Act, with all the employment paycheck protection money was coming out, we encouraged the Small Business Administration to say, you know, we understand you want to give this money to everybody and you don't want to leave out anybody, but to the extent people are going to be using this money for actual like religious worship, like you cannot use government money for actually, you know, supporting religion. I mean, it's one thing if you're using it to run a soup kitchen or something, that's a service, that's cool. But to the extent you're actually using it for like paying a minister who's doing services, then that should not be reimbursable. So the government should not, you know, they should not forgive the loan. They should require the, it should be required that the agency or organization pays it back, right? And so that was what we were pushing for. Um, unfortunately, the Trump administration was just completely unwilling to even you know discuss the issue and we just did not make much progress and the, the you know now basically the the administration i mean the, the program's over it's not it's not really continuing at the moment and so we are trying to get in to speak with the new leadership of SBA to sort of talk about the issue and how they could revise it and think about how to respond better in the future and maybe put contingencies in place and change the regulations so that they act appropriately in this area. So my goal is to sort of learn from this and not just let them, you know, leave it a chance next time there's an emergency, but to take proactive measures to make sure the law is strengthened in this area. Yeah, because I don't think a lot of people knew at the time, but it seemed like the PPP money was just going to anywhere in a way. The biggest giveaway of federal money. Joel Olstein church got it yeah got money to religion ever in our history it was what seven point it was more it was between seven and eight billion dollars that's just for churches it's not even counting religious schools which were another four to five billion dollars it's crazy and a lot of it when we know went to fraudulent like some of it went to this preacher that used to buy an airplane so, i mean mm -hmm. Stuff like that happened everywhere. Some churches didn't even were proven even not to exist. It wasn't just that it went to churches either. They gave the all these religious exemptions to things like reporting, to things like affiliation rules. Technically, the Catholic Church should not have been able to get the money at all. They built in a special exemption for religious organizations so that each individual chair a uh, parish could apply separately and get loans because the Catholic organizations themselves are too large. They would not have qualified. So that this is what we're talking about. Just just flat out, I don't know, graft. It's, it's terrible. Well, as someone who works consistently with government and the fact that kind of on the Republican side, they've been saying the government's terrible for 40 years, but anytime the government has a chance to give money to businesses, it's totally cool. Totally cool. Can you get on the side of like, well, if properly run, government can actually be a force for good. And it doesn't have to be a partisan thing. It just can be, can it, make a more equitable, better society for, for everybody. I think we're pretty firmly on that side um, that, you know, government serves a purpose. Yeah. That's why we have it. And it does important things in our society. And yes, that we need to uh, use it for those things and not undermine it at every opportunity. So, you know, I think that's something that we, I mean, for example, non-discrimination laws, like we support those, right? And that's the one thing the government does. And that's just one example, but there's, you know, some regulations are really important. It seems like a dirty word, but regulations are are really important. And when it comes to, I don't know, I'm speaking more about Allison's personal views more than American atheists, but, you know, when it comes to businesses, um, you know, they hold so much power. And the only power that citizens, average citizens have is the government. And people sometimes forget that, right? That the only power that people have is the government. So it, it, the only real, real way to contest against businesses. And so if, if unless you want businesses to run roughshod over your rights in every way and dimension, the government is the answer to that. So you kind of have to set these things up in tension. Otherwise, you know, you'll have no one defending and no way to reinforce and support your rights. Um, so I, I tend to think about these big monopolies of power and how we can prevent any of them from being um, tyrannical, not not just the government, but also businesses. And that's just personal. It's not. I feel like it's something where you can get behind and yeah, you know, is a combination of the, yeah, the official and the, uh, and the personal, which is totally understandable. So when you, uh, you know, 
you you do a job where you're involved very you know personally all the time. What is something you do to kind of get away from it all? <laughs> well, I've already mentioned the gaming aspect, right? <laughs> really? Yeah. I don't know if there's anything else or if that's like, you know. uh, yeah, no, I'm a big gamer. I'm into video games. I do a lot of online, you know, uh, what is it? Final Fantasy 14. I'm really into those big online MMORPGs. Um, so what else do I do? I have two cats. Uh, her names are Anna and Belle. They're great. Nice. And, you know, I have, I guess that's it. A lot of friends and family. It's been challenging this past year or so. I'm looking forward to finally getting my shot at some point and being able to see people a little bit more. Um, but we'll see. Yeah, hopefully you can. Um, so Deborah in the chat room asked if American Atheist had a platform advocacy regarding disabled people. And just wonder if you could say anything about that. Sure. Well, we support um, you know non-discrimination laws across the government. And so we don't have a specific platform regarding um, you know, disability rights. We work in coalition with a lot of different groups that focus on those issues. And so we, by, by working together, we support a lot of things like sign on letters that those disability rights groups focus on, if that makes sense. So we can reinforce their asks. Because I mean, if you're talking about the, I don't know, civil rights division at an agency, they enforce um, non-discrimination things when it comes to not only religious discrimination, but also disability and LGBTQ and, and racial discrimination. So it's important that we work together with other types of civil rights groups in that respect. So that's just one example. Um, but we don't have, um, you know, a specific platform regarding disability. If we see religious exemptions to any type of, you know, law, especially, you know, non-discrimination laws when it comes to disability, for example, then, then we obviously we definitely push back on those, and we try to sort of prevent the passage of non-discriminate. I'm sorry, of religious exemption laws uh, to import protections broadly. Okay, well, sounds good. Um, so, how can people uh, support American Atheists and kind of follow your work? Fantastic. Yeah. So you should check out our website. It's atheist.org, and the um, the data work is at secularsurvey.org. Um, definitely sign up on the website for action alerts because that's one major way that we reach out to people and let you know what's going on in your area. So action alerts mean that we let you know, oh, there's a bad bill going on in Texas, like the one I just mentioned, and please contact the committee, which you can do so super easily because we write the email for you. All you have to do is hit two buttons and it sends it to your lawmakers. Um, so that's a good way because, you know, the more we can engage people and let them know that they're atheists in their communities that care about these important issues, then, you know, we're able to sort of sway lawmakers more. So that's one one way to engage. Sounds good. Well, I know everybody would like to engage more. Well, thank you, uh, Allison, for being on the show. And thanks for uh, the cat uh, cameo. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Always appreciate that. This gets out. The next words you say will be muffled by your own butt. Live read. If you thought we didn't get enough trans talk in this episode, here's the latest from Boom Lawyered about the Texas law that threatens to remove trans kids from their parents if the parents are supportive of their kids' gender identities. Listen to that, then take a moment to join me in saying three, two, one. Fuck Richard, Richard Dawkins, and fuck the people who support his science and empathy free takes on trans people. Get educated, my man. We all need to get educated. If you want to support this show, be like Freethinker215, Alan Marks, Hugh Man, Chris of the Postmodern Polymath Podcast, Larry Daryl, and the other Daryl, and go to patreon.com backslash Zachrelige, Z-A-C-H-R-I-L-E-G-E. Follow me on Twitter, like the Zachrelige Cast page on Facebook. Please send guest ideas to zachrelige.cast at gmail.com. Thank you to Allison for being on this week. I have Sarah Ray coming up this week, so we just keep on going. Until then, let's continue the conversation.